uh, begin uh, this evening um, with uh, prayer, and then I'm going to let Jim uh, take over and um, allow him to share with us uh, some some of his knowledge and his experience with teaching. Again, for those who may be joining us for the first time, you'll see at the bottom right hand side there's a chat room and just click in the box there and you'll feel free to type any comments or questions or anything that you might have um, as we go along. So feel free to do that uh, anytime during Jim's presentation. But let's begin uh, with prayer. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful uh, for this day, um, the sunshine, and uh, that we can gather from all over the conference. Uh, we're thankful for our churches that we represent and uh, the work that you are doing in, in the midst of them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, be with us in uh, a very special way through our computers and that you would allow this time to be a time of teaching and that we would have our hearts open to receive all that you have for us. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, Jim, I'm, I'm going to right. give it over to you and um, and just join in when I need to. Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time. Uh, that says something about uh, the way you feel God has called you to skill yourself and to spend your time in learning what he has for you in the kingdom. So thanks for that. Tammy, I might just say, since I no longer have access on this particular screen to that question box down there, you may have to alert me as those come along. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll go for a few, a couple of points or a few slides, and then we'll, we'll pause and we'll see if there are questions at that time. And I know we're kind of semi-interactive -inter here. And so we'll figure out who has questions and all of that. Well, probably you are coming from very different kinds of experiences in teaching. And some of you uh, are attracted to this topic because you love teaching already. You feel gifted in it. When you read Romans 12 or when you read 1 Corinthians 12 and you see those lists of spiritual gifts, you find yours right there in that teaching uh, part. And uh, some of you, though, may, in fact, say, well, I, that hasn't been my experience that people have said after I taught, I think you have a gift for that. And yet I offer myself when that's needed. And God uh, has blessed that to, in a certain way. Uh, you need to know that if you don't find yourself in that spiritual gift, that uh, we're still called at times to serve in those ways. And we're called to grow <clears throat> and to be skilled in those ways. And so uh, we, I hope that tonight some of our conversation uh, there may be one slide that means more to you than another, and that's fine. And uh, I hope there's something there where the Lord says this is uh, increasing that skill in your teaching. I want to use a guide tonight. I think curriculum is so helpful. Probably all of us in this session have our own stories of teaching. And probably we could offer one another, just in conversation, very good advice about teaching. Isn't it great, though, when you run across a resource that is so helpful and that kind of uh, sums up what we might call best teaching practices? And so tonight I want to begin uh, by, well, that's not advancing. Let me see if I can advance it this way. I want to begin by pointing out the resource that I'm relying heavily on tonight, and it's Teaching to Change Lives by Howard Hendricks who taught for years at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And uh, you may already know his name, may have read other things, um, or even seen this title by him. So Howard Hendricks is a veteran teacher and uh, certainly impacted, well, we probably can't count all the lives that he impacted. He distilled years of that teaching uh, practice into this book. And if you know, Dr. Hendrick's style is very warm. He's, he's a simple person. Maybe that's why he was a great teacher. And so the book reflects that. And it's a, it's a resource that even though tonight we'll be using that some, uh, you would like on your bookshelf. It's, it's very, uh, if you're wondering, is that a book that's readable or is that one of those books that, hmm, well, it's very readable and very powerful principles that you'll see tonight. So I'm, I'm taking 
quite a bit of information from that. Also putting uh, some other information in or reworking it a little differently than uh, he had it, but basically represents his, uh, his work. He has what he calls uh, laws of teaching. Now, what he doesn't mean by that is some kind of rigid way of understanding that you have to, uh, you have to uh, conform to a very uh, heavy uh, system type of an approach to teaching. I think what he means more by that is when we say like a law of gravity. Uh, the law of gravity is a powerful principle. We know that wherever we are on earth, that it's uh, the law of gravity is at work. Uh, we know that if it's broken, certain things happen. If we work with the law of gravity, uh, rather amazing things can happen. And so that's what he means when he refers to that there are laws of teaching. And he offers a series of these that we will uh, go through tonight. And just know that his own personality didn't reflect sort of a legalistic understanding of law, but probably there are very few people you and I know more joyful, uh, free, liberated kind of uh, interaction with other people than Howard Hendricks. So don't misunderstand the term law, but see it in this powerful principle kind of way. So let's begin there. And he numbers those, and they are very, they may not be entirely chronological, but there is a, a very intentional kind of way of uh, going from one to two to three, and which I think you'll pick up on here uh, as we go through the slides. So number one is the law of the teacher. And here is kind of the explanation of that law. If you stop growing today, you stop teaching tomorrow. And I think most of us have had the experience of uh, being a teacher who is excited about what we have just learned and we want to pass that on. And this law has to do with, am I a growing person who has sort of, I don't know, information flowing through me and I am always challenged myself as a learner and I want to challenge other people as learners. I love learning. You know, when I deal with college students, this is the hardest kind of switch to, uh, to help them uh, reach up with their finger and inside somewhere and, and flip. And that is the switch that says, well, I'm here and I have to learn versus the switch that says, you know what? Uh, learning is fun and it opens up a whole new world to me and I'm a richer person when I do that. So the law of the teacher is that we need to grow as, uh, as people. And certainly scripture tells us that that's true. As disciples and as teachers who are called to disciple others, we must keep growing uh, ourselves. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Paul uh, Peter says, to him be glory both now and forever. Now notice that it's not just knowledge we grow in. That's very important. But it's also grace. And knowledge with grace gives us the freedom and the power to be able to use that knowledge in right ways, in kingdom ways. And then toward the end of this statement, Peter says, to him be glory both now and forever. And so us growing in grace and knowledge brings glory to God. And that's a good reminder, uh, maybe for those of us who think, you know, I, I really developed a very good lesson. And if we uh, move over into the territory of being prideful about that, then we need to be reminded by Peter's words that it's God that's to be glorified by our teaching and not ourselves. We may feel very fulfilled in that, and, and God wants us, I think, to have that sense of satisfaction. Uh, and yet that's different than pride. So God is the one who is glorified. Look at Paul's words of the Philippians when he said, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We know that Paul is also giving a little bit of an autobiographical uh, word here that he has had to leave some things behind. And yet I, he's, I think, referring to some good things also. He's leaving behind some uh, uh, 
things that God has done in his life to strain toward the next things that God is doing in his life. And so we learn from our past, but we don't live there. We look toward the future. That's a learning kind of mindset. I'm looking toward the future. What's next? What do I next need to know? A teacher would say, what, what do I next need to pass along to others? And we press toward God's call on our lives. And it could be that the teaching task is a momentary call, or it could be, like I said a moment ago, if we're, if we're living out our gift, it's really a lifelong call in our lives. Another uh, verse that I, I think is instructive to us, the student who works hard will become like his teacher. Uh, the goal, really, and this is a very uh, uh, Jewish idea of teaching, the goal is that the student picks up more than just knowledge in a teacher, but picks up character in the teacher and how that teacher has used that knowledge, is living out that knowledge. So as we grow, then we have the ability, and we may say the right, to ask other people to grow. Uh, it's um, we, we do need sometimes to uh, give ourselves some grace, and life gets busy, and we don't experience the same rate of growth, maybe, that we have uh, in earlier uh, periods. But in general, if we're a growing person, other people sense that. They can tell it by the, the way that we're excited about what we've learned. And that encourages them, maybe even inspires them, is the way to put it, to grow themselves. So, ways to keep growing. You say, well, we're supposed to grow. Uh, let's get practical how we do that. Really, the biblical picture of growth is a holistic kind of picture. So we grow in all areas of our lives. We grow intellectually. Uh, we grow physically. We grow spiritually. And we grow socially. You know, the Luke passage here in chapter 2 of Luke describes that Jesus grew. when he was, It's Jesus' early life that he is growing in each of these ways as a part of his humanity, uh, that he is growing in stature and he's growing in favor with uh, God and with people. So uh, what, what people are very much attracted to is a person that is uh, in all areas of their life seeking to be a growing person. And that enables us, it's, it's very difficult to teach a Bible lesson without running into a challenge in one or more of these areas. A lot of times at the end of a Bible lesson, we're asked to grow socially. We're asked to do something. We'll talk about that here in a little while. But that we're asked to be pushed into the lives of other people. And so it's holistic. We need just to keep a sense of wonder as well. We live in a beautiful and fascinating world. And uh, so we, uh, we need to, there's a childlike kind of quality that's very helpful to a teacher to keep, uh, that we uh, are interested in the world. Since it's God's world, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's sometimes uh, fascinating to watch how the Holy Spirit will take what we have learned about the world and work that into what we are in the moment called to teach. So we're, uh, we're still plugged into the wonder of the world. We know that it's almost impossible to develop as a teacher and to help our students unless we're reading. This is the primary way that we take information in. And it's not like there's a contest and we get AR points for uh, our reading, but uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to work with the same ideas in new ways or to add ideas to those and to build unless we're taking information in. And for most of us, that's reading. Then we take advantage of continuing education opportunities. Uh, sometimes those are within our local church. Sometimes they're in the community. Uh, this is one of those kind of opportunities, and you're taking advantage of it. So, And finally, we, we need on some level to study our students. Who is this that I am before, standing before, sitting before, teaching? What are their lives like? What are their needs? Uh, we grow when we understand people more. And uh, instead of pigeonholing people, we kind of come to each person as a person of great worth to God. God knows that person uh, intimately. 
and we're interested in that in that person and in his needs and her needs. Uh, so there is a sense in which we study people. If we do these kinds of things, we're a growing person, and others sense that when we uh, are before them and we are and we are teaching. Now let's cover the law two, and then we'll ask for some questions. But law two, Dr. Hendricks would say, is the law of education. And that is the way people learn determines how you teach. I was in a conversation not very long ago with someone who uh, has taught for a long time. And this person was very resistant. Uh, we weren't talking about this law, but they, but this person would have been resistant to this law because um, this teacher expressed, I think it's almost all up to the student to learn. And I will teach what I know, and it's the student's responsibility to learn. Well, certainly students have a responsibility. And yet people learn differently, and a teacher has to know that people learn differently and respect that law and work with that. If we truly care about our students, we do challenge them to come toward the teaching material, but we also challenge ourselves to move toward them. So the way that people learn determines in large part how we, uh, how we teach. Many of you are familiar with the name Abraham Maslow, a psychologist uh, who you've heard of uh, needs and the hierarchy of needs. He also talked about learning. And it's helpful for us to see from the bottom to the top of this chart uh, what his four levels of learning were. Look at the very bottom and you see that when it comes to uh, how we see ourselves as a learner, there's what he called unconscious incompetence. And that's when we don't know what we don't know. Um, I don't know all that uh, I, I could. Uh, you, you may talk with me about physics, and I have very little to go on. I took physics in college, uh, and uh, so I, I would not be able to know the difference between levels of knowledge in uh, physics. And there is a real sense in which I'm very unconscious of what I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you an area that I should study. I don't even know the area to study of physics uh, to know more. So there's an unconscious incompetence. And Dr. Hendricks says that really a lot of the time this is where we want to begin with students. We don't want to assume what they do know or what they don't know. And we don't want to ask them what they don't know because they can't, they can't tell us what they don't know, they can tell us what they do. So an unconscious incompetence is a very basic level, uh, almost a pre-learning kind of level. And then you come up to conscious incompetence. And this is when we know what we don't know. When I finished seminary, I had a much better idea of all of the things about theology and ministry that I didn't know. It was a very humbling experience. Some of you have had that with your formal education. Uh, when you left a certain level of education, you said to yourself, well, they may give me a piece of paper, but I, this, this only represents what I know, and there are about a thousand other pieces of paper that would represent what I don't know. So as a learner, we come to a place where we say, hmm, now I know enough to know how little I know. And then there's a conscious competence. Uh, we have a little more confidence in what we do know, and we're able to share with others what we do know. We're able to teach what we do know. There's a really big step between number two there and number three, where we become conscious uh, and more confident of what we do know. And then finally, learning becomes such a part of us that we reach a final stage where we have unconscious competence. It's almost like we forgot we learned that. Uh, my younger sister, when she was just a little girl, we would teach her something and she would say, uh, yeah, I know that. And we would say, you didn't know that. You just learned that. And she said, no, I have that. I had that in my head. <laughs> and uh, she had made a very quick step. By just learning it, she had felt like she had always known it. 
And it's really a great place to be when you have learned kind of your own in your own area that you like best to learn in. And you're so uh, comfortable with that knowledge that now you're really unconscious of how competent that you are. And uh, this is a good spirit in which to teach, a spirit of which uh, you're, you're humble and you are certainly willing to admit there's a lot that you don't know, but you also feel pretty comfortable in sharing what, what you know. And some of those things are just a part of you. It's a really great, it's a really great place to, uh, to get to. Now, our next slide kind of continues on this theme. And so the question is, are there some basics that we can use for the law of education? And there are. First of all, one of the, one of the ways to attend to the law of education is to teach people how to think. And I don't know if what this isn't the greatest goal of education is just to, um, skill people with how they can learn uh, how they can think for themselves. You know, in the oppressive governments, this does not happen. People are told they cannot think for themselves. And so it is really a very basic human right, God-given right, that we should be able to think. Uh, one of the uh, great ideas that came out of the Protestant Reformation was um, a signal to the church on the part of the people. Well, we, we want, we want to think for ourselves. And so how do we teach people to do that? Well, we free them to ask questions and we have an environment in which is okay to ask questions. And we say that in that environment, there are no, uh, there are no silly or dumb or stupid, uh, questions that all questions, uh, are, are good. You've probably noticed that when one student has a question, the other, several of the others have it as well. And one of them has sort of had the courage and maybe they're more extroverted or whatever uh, to ask that question and the others benefit from that question. So we need to have that environment where we ask questions. And then it's okay to, when we're studying especially things as deep as theology and as the Bible, it's okay to live with contradictions. Uh, we are not weak-minded if we come to a place where we say, you know what, we're in the territory of mystery here. We can't explain how this is true and how this is true. It's, it's uh, difficult to explain how God is almighty and yet God gives us free will. Uh, those, those issues haven't been totally clarified in uh, as theological questions. And the reason is because there's mystery there. And so it's okay sometimes to live with a bit of that. We want to think and we want to especially think about what others have had to say. And yet we might be, we might have to live with contradictions. So we teach people how to think. We also teach people how to learn that there is a learning process. Sometimes I think, especially in our youth, we get we got frustrated with the learning process. Well, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to write these vocabulary words? And we why do we have to review that? And why do we have to test on this? And then we get a little older and we realize that we we actually learn better with a learning process. And one of the basic ways, of course, of thinking about the learning process is this idea of uh, synthesis, where we have a, something big here and we want to learn this, but to, to really know it and learn it, we have to break it down into those smaller parts. And then, because we now understand those parts, we're able to go back to the big picture and better understand what, uh, what that is. That's, that's the whole process of, uh, you know, of synthesis. And, uh, so, Teaching people that it's okay to go through a process to learn. By the way, that's our model of discipleship too, isn't it? We disciples don't, uh, you don't wake up one day and you're not a disciple and, and you want to be a disciple. And so the next day you wake up and you are, uh, that's, it's a, it's a long, 
process of being faithful and uh, working with the Spirit who teaches us. So that's very much like discipleship, uh, learning how to learn and learning as a process. And then third, uh, we have to teach people how to work. Uh, sometimes I think we shy away from uh, telling learners, well, uh, there's a lot more about this to learn, and you can go here, and you can go here, and you can go here, and uh, and and encourage them to do that. Encourage them to learn on their own. Uh, that takes that takes digging. It, you know, it takes work. In other words, it's not really very healthy if you give the sense in your learning environment, all of your knowledge is going to come from me, and I will spoon feed you, and uh, I am, I am threatened if you read something or you study something and you come to class with that and I don't know that. Uh, that's not the environment that we want to uh, create. We want an environment where students are encouraged and know that they can go and dig on their own. And when they bring that back, they will be, um, in, they will, they will get to present that and they'll get to, there's a, there's a forum here, and they'll get to uh, show the digging that they've done. All right. Now, Tammy, I need your help in knowing if there are questions already up or if there's a moment we need to pause. I've been rolling here for a little while. I can't hear yeah, you. There, um, so far, no questions. Okay. okay. How about now? All right. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, those, so far, those no questions. Have... Um, okay, but, you tell me if they come in, and I'll keep rolling. I will, and but but if anyone does have a question, then feel free to to right. again type it in the chat room. So yes. Okay, on to another law, the law of activity. And Dr. Hend Hendricks would put it this way: maximum learning is always the result of maximum involvement. And you know how this is. Uh, you know how this is very true. I cannot look over someone's shoulder and learn something on the computer. Uh, I, I only get about 20% of that. That's my best. But if they will look over my shoulder and allow me to press the button they tell me to press and do what um, they uh, instruct me in that active kind of way, I am active, I am doing it. Well, you know, I'm up to 70% then, and the other 30%, I just have to ask again until I do it several more times. So uh, the law of activity, maximum learning is always the result of maximum involvement on the part of learners. A very appropriate Bible verse that uh, teaches this principle that uh, of doing is uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount uh, teaches anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me. Notice the connection between listening and a certain type of learning and a doing. An obedience is wise, like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. But anyone who hears my teaching, that is, they're exposed to a learning kind of process, but they ignore it, is foolish, like a person who builds a house on the sand and uh, over and over in Jesus ministry with the disciples there is a uh, what we might call a a teaching dynamic and then there's a going out and a doing dynamic and we'll look a little bit later there's another law that has a little bit to do with this so what are five forms then to get more practical once again what are five forms of meaningful activity Dr. Hendricks uh, lists these. Yep. Uh, let me just say that G uh, Jim Hadfield made a great uh, comment about what you just said about, you know, don't just show me, but let me do it. And he said, don't grab my mouse, but walk me through it, you know, instead of yeah. someone taking over and doing it that, you know, allow you to walk through it and, and uh, do it for yourself. And so I think that's a, a great point as well. Yeah, we all resonate with uh, with that. There are, I think, some um, exceptional people out there who kind of have a mind that uh, photographic memory sort of thing, photographic uh, 
uh, hearing and they hear something and they can do it. But most of us need <laughs> most of us need to do it. So the five forms of meaningful activity. Activity is meaningful that provides direction without dictatorship. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't give the impression that we want people to do activity because we like to boss them around. I want you to do what I want you to do. Uh, of course, all of us resist that. We, uh, we're willing to be led, but not driven most of the time. And so, uh, sure, there's direction from a teacher. Why don't you do this? But there's not an authoritarian sort of spirit about that. Activity that stresses is meaningful, that stresses using what was just learned. And you know, there is a time element here. Uh, that And there's a challenge here that to put learning to work as quickly as we can. Now, sometimes there is a topic that uh, we're teaching uh, or we're learning, and it's just not immediately clear of what that content has to do with my life today or tomorrow. So it's not always true that we can put, you know, put to work immediately what was just learned. But if you've had the experiences like I've had, that what the Sunday school lesson was about Sunday has everything to do with something that happens Thursday. Um, that is a reminder to us. The Spirit's reminding us. Now, you know, I had you there for a reason to learn that, and now I'm asking you to put that to use. So sometimes we as teachers need to encourage that and say, Thursday's coming when this might be our chance to put that to work. So that's meaningful activity. Uh, saying I want to put this <clears throat> put this to work because I just learned it. Third, activity beyond the purpose of busyness and entertainment. Uh, we don't have to be a dictator, but sometimes we do. Uh, we don't make it very clear to a learner why they're doing this. It just seems like a hoop to jump through, and so or just something to do instead of. Instead of this uh, sort of uh, learning by lecture, well, let's change something up and let's, you know, let's uh, role play. Role play can be wonderful. I'm going to mention that and again in a moment. But if it's just for an entertainment type value, the the, listen, the learner doesn't always appreciate that. Also, meaningful activity uh, teaches not just what we believe, but why we believe it. It, uh, all of us, I think, know that we can have stuff in our head. This is what I believe. And yet when the first person challenges that, you begin getting to a why question pretty quickly. Why do you believe that? What, isn't there something beyond just the belief part of that? Isn't there something more powerful uh, as, as to the why? And so often in teaching the Bible, this goes back to the nature of God. This is the kind of God God is, the kind of person God is shaping me into. The why is what I'm becoming. What, what do I believe? I believe this. Why? Because that is shaping me into who God is uh, making me to be. And then finally, activity that includes problem-solving situations. This helps with the action part, that there are, uh, that there are problems that can be changed. There are solutions to those. And uh, activity that surrounds our younger son was in a uh, program called Life Lab uh, when he was in, in uh, elementary school. I'm sorry, our, our oldest son. And this was very much their model. It was take now what the, the content was, what the material was, and give a problem with that and ask the student to use what they've just learned in solving that problem. And it was great. And the, the students responded to it uh, so well because they had that they had that sense that they were putting their learning to work. So the law of activity. Jim, we're going through these. Yep. Um, as you go to the next law, um, uh, Mark uh, from Franklin first had a great uh, point as well. Uh, learning must answer the question: What's in it for me? Um, and so they have to have that, you know, that want to know why is this um, why is this important for me to know um, as well. 
so that's a great way to put it. Often, you know, our boy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Elaine says, answering the student's age old question, why do I need to learn this and when will I use this? Um, you know, just even last week, our oldest son said, asked us about some math law, says, do you ever use this? And we were like, well, to be honest, no, we don't use that, you know. And so I think they have to know how. How is this going to affect my life? How is this going to make a difference? And, and when will I use this? Or why do I need to know it? You know, I think those are important things to ask as teachers. Um, and Mark has added, I must see a benefit to learning. Then I will change my behavior. So those huh. are just some great comments, you know. Yes. And I think. That's what you've been saying as well. Yeah. And I think that, I think the laws, especially we're talking about, uh, this evening are very Western kind of thinking um, that we, especially we Americans, are very practical. Sometimes you have to go to another culture uh, to see how how very oriented we are in our American culture toward what's practical, what I can use right now. And of course, those are our learners, and we have to respond to them in that in that kind of way. And uh, unless there's a certain um, discipline that we are learning that is very heady, very conceptual, and the learner doesn't anticipate that that's going to be put to use as much as it's just, just going to expand the mind. And so uh, those are fine. But most of us uh, want to know, you know, when I walk out of here, am I going to, am I going to use this? Good comments. Number four, the law of communication. To truly impart information that re, that require to truly impart information requires the building of bridges, and uh, all of us know that this feeling that we have learned something, we feel called to in the teaching role to pass that along, and uh, we wish there was a direct kind of mind reading that could happen in that. What, how could I just open my brain and you open your brain and I'll just kind of toss this to you and you'll take it and put it in. But that's not the way that is. Uh, there is the whole, there is the whole skill, the whole dynamic of communication. And that can be frustrating at times. We sense, I know this and my learner is not getting this. What, what do I do? <laughs> And that's just because the, there's a process of communication that has to go on. The word communication comes from the Latin word communis, which means common. So communication requires establishing something in common, building a bridge with the listener. And it's okay that, that we're asking the listener to build that bridge as well, back toward us. Jesus and the woman at the well, for example, had something in common, both were focused on this idea of thirst. And Jesus used that idea of thirst. He was physically thirsty. She was spiritually thirsty. And so he built a bridge toward her. In fact, he taught her quite a bit. He taught her about worship. He taught her something about culture, that he was a man willing to speak with her. Uh, he taught her something in his non-verbals, which is a part of the communication process. So uh, it's a case in point about Jesus building a bridge. There are three great questions to ask that uh, focus on that, that helped us to focus on uh, a, a quality communication. If there's, I would say this is the most important slide in our time together tonight. Because if you could uh, walk away, especially with these three questions in mind, uh, it'll. I think you'll really find as a teacher, it starts. Uh, it starts. It starts you thinking about how many different directions you can go with your content. Question number one, what do I want my listener to know? Most, like our time together tonight, uh, it's limited. And so most classroom situations are limited. So I can't teach everything. What do I want my student to know? What can we not leave this place without knowing? What do I want my listener to feel? Human beings are um, 
emotive beings. God has feelings, and we're created in his image, and so we have feelings. So what do I want my listener to feel? We don't want to abuse people's feelings. We don't want to manipulate people's feelings. But there are a number of things we teach, especially from the Bible, that require us to feel something. Some kind of, maybe we want to feel righteous anger when Jesus uh, clears the tables of the money changers. Uh, maybe we want to feel compassion when Jesus is uh, healing someone. That text asks us to do that, to feel something. We are not giving our student what the student needs if we don't get into that some. And then what do I want my listener to do? There's the action again. Is there something this is asking me to, to do? And, and how do I be faithful to understanding a message? Those are so very important questions. We could probably do an entire session on those and because there's a lot that surrounds those three questions. Uh, but on to just a very, just very briefly. Yes. Hey, Jim. Um, Mark added a fourth one to that. Um, it says, how about adding uh, this question? What is the behavior I want my student to exhibit? Mm. Mm. Out of their personality. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Almost, almost, Basically, you know, who do I want my student to become? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he says oh, yeah. character, you know, what is their character, their values, you know, because of your teaching, what, what is the result of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what we're really after is good transformation, thought. isn't it? Very, yeah, very good thought. Right. Um, I don't want to talk through all of what's on this, but I did want to include this uh, chart. And this is different from the one that Dr. Howard uh, Hendricks uh, includes in his book, but uh, this is the communication process where there's a message and people are sending and receiving messages. Sometimes those messages get um, get caught in what we call noise. I see that you know noise is in these kind of PAL sort of things on here, and there's feedback and all of that. It's very important just to look over and remember that there's a lot of things happening in a communication process between even just two people. And if you increase that, the dynamics even more complex. And then there's law number five, the law of the heart. Teaching that impacts us is not head to head, but heart to heart. Uh, I suspect there are a good number of us from the Wesleyan tradition who are uh, a, a part of this presentation tonight. And we know very much what the heart meant to John Wesley, that he had a heart religion, that he himself discovered that knowledge in the head even of the most uh, solid theology was not enough. That somehow it had to make its way to the heart. Here's a couple of scriptures we remember. Uh, the Shema, of course, you know, says that, um, uh, you know, the Lord is one, and we to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Of course, in the Hebrew and the Jewish tradition, heart means that totality we talked about earlier. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the intellect and the emotion. And the will, all three. For for those who God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. The real heart of this of this uh, scripture is that uh, God's will is that we be conformed to the likeness of His Son, so we we become like Christ. And conformed means poured into the mold of, I <laughs> like the way Doctor Hendricks puts it. It's just like your Jello mold in the refrigerator. Uh, you are to be poured into the mold of Christ, and uh, that that means that you know uh, the heart has to be involved in that. You know, uh, you run across the terms. I'm almost sure those Greek terms uh, by several Greek rhetoricians. It began with Socrates and Aristotle, and uh, talked about how important these three were: the logos, which is really the content that we teach. And then there is ethos. This is that character we just talked about uh, that we're shaped into. We want someone else to be shaped into. As a teacher, people care about our character. They should. Uh, do, does, my, does this person's uh, life 
as, as much as possible line up with what is being taught. There's a believability about that. And then pathos is the feeling we just talked about. And um, by the way, you've probably already noticed that these are those, there's another, although he talks about these in separate parts of the book, this is another way of saying, what do I want my uh, listener to know, logos? What do I want my listener to feel, ethos? This, well, I'm sorry, feel, pathos. And what do I want them to do? That's pretty close that in the doing that there is the personality and the will involved, the character involved. So these go very much along those, uh, along those lines. But that's also helpful to us when we think about the communication process. Who am I as a communicator? Logos is what I teach. Ethos is who I am. And uh, the, the character with which I teach. And pathos is the feeling or emotion that I elicit from the listener, the learner. Number six, we're almost uh, done here. The law of encouragement. Teaching tends to be most effective when the learner is highly motivated. You and I know that people are motivated by different things. Uh, someone said something, you know, not long ago, it's something like, I just had made a comment and they said, you're not very motivated by money, are you? I said, you know, I'm really not very motivated by money. Other things do motivate me. Uh, and so we won't always know wh who among our students is motivated by what, but the law encouragement says we have to pay attention to that. What motivates? Here's some things we, uh, in, in kind of the, uh, in, in a lesson form, we may keep in mind that uh, there is a telling stage. What's that logos? What are the, what's the facts, the meat of what needs to be known, the content, so to speak? Uh, then what can be, what can be uh, shown that might motivate our listener? What situation can be pointed to? Uh, how did someone really model well the biblical principle of that situation? If I'm teaching about forgiveness, and I know this instance over here, of how someone did that so well, and they went to the person themselves, and they didn't talk about the person or with anyone else. They went, and they, they, they sought reconciliation with that person, did the biblical pattern for that. We need to show. Illustrations help to show people. And you know what? That motivates people. When there's, a, when there's a powerful illustration of a principle, it really motivates us to want to live that out in our lives. And then there's, there may be a controlled doing that we can do even in the classroom. We can role play. Um, how can we ask students to explain in their own words? Uh, or how would they say this to someone else? Uh, there's this, you know, can we do this? I think one of the most successful ways of learning evangelism is um, unless you're naturally kind of supernaturally gifted for evangelism is being in a classroom where you speak with someone else about your faith someone else that is going to speak with you about their faith you're you're uh, you're you have a controlled situation but you're actively trying to live out the principles that you just learned and then finally uncontrolled doing this is where we go out into the world <laughs> and there's a certain kind of holy boldness that we have to have to live out what we've learned and uh, we can't control that. We don't know when that forgiveness is going to be needed, but, uh, but now we're sent out to do that in another, another realm, the real world. Uh, all right, number seven, and this is our final law, by the way. Oops, I'm sorry. Number seven is the law of readiness. The teaching learning process will be most effective when both student and teacher are adequately prepared. And I think that. Dr. Hendricks really does us a service of reminding us of this, because even though in our formal education uh, we are asked to come to class prepared, I'm not sure that in our Christian education settings that we often think this way. This is a really good reminder. And so the teaching learning process would be most effective when both student and teacher are adequately prepared. And he recommends that more often than we do, that we work on an assignment kind of model and that it's okay to come prepared with something you were asked to do. Now, the uh, several of our classes here at Wesleyan Heights, of course, use a, a formal curriculum like the uniform series or the international uh, series. 
and they will read it that week and come to class prepared because they uh, there are questions in there that ask you to reflect and they'll reflect on those and they'll say you know this week when I was thinking of this question it reminded me of this event that happened to me and so they'll share that that is a powerful way to learn when students are prepared to teach one another if you've taught much you know that uh, even though you're kind of the one that is teaching or at least facilitating uh, students teach each other so much especially when they're prepared to do so so how do we help students get ready for a lesson Dr. Hendricks says go ahead help them with an assignment to be prepared assignments must be meaningful and creative not just busy work we, we saw a while ago that people can really resist when they feel they're doing something that really is not very meaningful number two assignments must be thought-provoking um, it could be that we we say you know next week we're going to talk about this you know unusual topic and we're going to be in Revelation and and Jesus is going to be described as the morning star and I wonder if sometime this week you will get up early enough on a clear morning watch the weather forecast and I wonder if you would find the morning star and so they come to class and they say I did that and they're able to talk about you know well how, how now can you relate to Jesus as the morning star uh, that's a that's a creative but it's a thought-provoking kind of assignment assignments must be doable not an unrealistic load you remember Jesus criticized uh, the Pharisees by saying you you ask people to do too much you ask them to do the undoable you can't even do those things and so uh, assignments don't need to have this uh, heavy legalistic sort of feel about them but they must be doable and um, uh, and people feel like that when they're asked to do that they can they can do that okay uh, you know what we've worked through the seven laws that are mentioned in this great uh, book and so there might be a Tammy let me know if there have been comments now uh, along the way Now, I think um, as we were going along, we we've, we've shared some of that, and mm -hmm. um, and so if anyone else has anything you would like to add, um, I think this has been helpful for us to think through again uh, some of the principles of teaching and how we can best prepare and know our students and know our material. Um, Daniel is down here uh, adding something, so. This is great information and very helpful. So hopefully, Good. again, that's what these have been designed for, is for us to um, be better equipped in what God is calling us to do in our local communities, in our local churches. And, um, and so if anyone else has anything uh, to add, Jim, I want to thank you. Um, mm -hmm for your willingness to prepare this and uh, to share with us this evening. Again, we got a couple people who are typing, so we'll give it just okay. a second. Mark says, uh, thank you, Jim, for sharing, and thank you, Tammy. Um, Daniel says, we're going to get creative in Linton, which is their church, for our Sunday school classes now. Uh, I like the acting part and getting involved. That, mm. would, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Again, some good practical parts of this. John says, thank you. Anna says, thank you. Got a few more. Well, we appreciate you and your time and your ministry of where you are all across um, the conference. And we know that um, when, when your local church is strong and vital, that is a reflection on all of our churches. And so we are thankful for your ministry and your individual uh, situations. Uh, Linda did, um, Linda Sparks asked about the PowerPoint. Uh, Jim is going to send that to me, and then what I'll do is tomorrow I'll send a follow-up email, and um, and we'll send that uh, out to everyone. Uh, and then we are also going to have these posted on the Connectional Cafe uh, website, and uh, give us, um, our communication staff 
has been short staffed because we've had someone who has been out uh, with surgery. And so they have been overwhelmed trying to do three people's job um, with one person, one and a half really. And so anyway, eventually we're going to have that up on Connectional Cafe and um, and then uh, you can watch it there as well. And if someone that you know in your church uh, would benefit from it, uh, would like to take it, uh, then they can as well. Uh, Jim, I see that you said this is your first webinar experience. We're glad that you were a part of it. And uh, there will be more. In fact, in two weeks, we will not have one next Monday because it's the Monday after Easter. We figured everyone uh, would still be uh, in the midst of all the Easter celebrations. And so we will... Uh, not have uh, a session then, but in two weeks, Jim will be back with us and we'll be sharing about preaching. And uh, for any of you who are interested in um, serving as a lay uh, speaker in our churches, this will be a great uh, experience for you and very helpful information as you learn to prepare for sermons. And then uh, in and then the week after that um, will be about leadership, and I'll be leading that on the three H's of leadership. And so those are the two webinars that are coming up, and then there'll be more. This is uh, we are finding this to be in a very effective way of communicating across the conference, and so we're lining up more. Um, one on evangelism coming up, and then there'll be one on social principles and several things like that, but it may be early fall before we get those because we know summer's coming and people will be going in many different directions. But let me say, um, while I'm promoting them, uh, there's two others that we do have lined up in May, and Linda Sparks is on here, and she will be leading those. One is for all of our new lay delegates to conference. Uh, Linda will be leading one for anyone who hasn't been to conference before and wants to know kind of what's ahead for them. Uh, that will be in May, and we'll send out the dates for that. And then also, um, she is preparing one about lay leaders in a church. We have a lot of people who are serving as lay leaders, and if they want more direction on that, um, then Linda will be able to share um and again, we have that set up for May 11th. It will be the lay leader webinar. And then on the 18th will be the first time delegate webinar. So here we got several things coming up. So I'm excited and uh, appreciate all of you. And may you go in God's blessing and in his grace until we see each other again. And I hope everyone has a very uh, wonderful uh Holy Week, uh, as you draw closer to him in these next few days and experience anew his resurrection on Easter. So happy Easter, everyone. And take care. <laughs>